to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Ion Connect. This state-of-the-art co-working space and tech lab helps grow innovative ideas to commercialization and market launch. Our speaker this evening is John Neuenberg. John is an award-winning business coach. In an earlier life, John was the president of the BC Liquor Stores, and before that, he was an executive with a national menswear retailer. It's now time for us to put our hands together and give John Neuenberg a warm BBN welcome. Awesome, thanks very much for that, Roger. So we're gonna talk about the science of habit making. Do you know about 50% of what you do is habit? Which then translates, of course, to that 50, about half of the results you get in your life is a result of the habits you have. And so what are habits? Habits are everything from the way you get dressed or ready in the morning, the way you go about eating, getting into a car and putting on the seatbelt and starting the, the car, all of that is all done by habit, things that we do uh, un subconsciously without even giving it a second thought. So Aristotle put it this way, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So if you're here because you wanna find out, uh, have you ever committed to making a change and then failed to follow through? Roger gracefully uh, gave us an opportunity to talk about that. You wanna learn the secret of creating a new habit. So the first part of the talk is about habits and what it means. And then the second part of the talk is, what is a set of good habits? What are the habits of the people that get the best results? And we're gonna talk about that and then we'll talk about uh, how you might use that in your life and perhaps even help some of your clients. Is that all good with everybody? Does that meet everyone's expectations? Awesome. So uh, for extra reading or a place to get started, let me recommend these two books. Uh, the Atomic Habits is, in my opinion, the book of the year or the other one. And these are kind of the cornerstone books that are the foundation of what a lot of people are paying attention to these days, the science of habits. So outcome-based habits. So the way that some people think about their habits is they start with the outer ring of the circle, which is the, what your outcomes are, what you're wanting to achieve. I'm gonna lose some weight. Uh, and then the second part of that is then your process. How are you gonna go about it? And then the third part of the inner part is how you think about yourself. This is the least effective way of creating new habits. A better way to think about habits is start with your identity. So what is your identity? Then think about what that process is gonna look like and then think about what the outcomes are gonna be. So what, is it, what do I mean by identity? Jewel asked me this question a minute or two ago. So we're gonna approach two people. Both of them are looking to stop smoking. One person you offer a cigarette, that person says to you, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. The other person says to you, no thanks, I'm a non-smoker. Which of those two has a better chance of success? The one who says and identifies as a non-smoker. What are you thinking about when you say to someone, no thanks, I'm trying to quit? I am a smoker. I am a smoker. What are you focused on? You're focused on a cigarette. So here's the thing about the brain. I'm gonna ask you to do something and I want you to pay very close attention to me. Can, can I ask you to do that? Don't think of a polar bear. So here's the thing, a polar bear flashed in your mind because the brain can't do a don't. It can only do a do. The brain can't do a don't, it can only do a do. So when you say don't think of smoking, you are focused on the thing you don't want. If you want to, um, not think of a polar bear, the only way you can do that is to think of an apple, to think of the thing that you do want, the positive outcome the, 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 that, that you're looking for. So the first place to think about is if you're looking to lose weight, what do you focus on? You're thinking about losing weight. Instead, what you might be asking yourself, instead of saying, gee, I'm not gonna have that donut or the candy or whatever, the thing you'd wanna be asking yourself is what would a healthy person choose? Because that points in the direction of who you're becoming. Okay, so there's that thing called a habit loop. This is the way habits generally work, cue, craving, response, and reward. And here's what that looks like. You wake up, the craving is I wanna feel alert. You drink a cup of coffee and the reward is you're feeling great because now you're alive and alert. Or, 
hey, has this ever happened to anyone here? Your phone buzzes with the new text message. You want to learn the content of that text message, and you grab your phone to read, and then you feel good about that because um, you get actually a shot of dopamine in your head. You just hit yourself with a shot of Coke. Literally. That's why it feels so good. And so once in a while, it's a good thing. If that's how you structure your life, then it becomes debilitating or un undermines your capabilities. So the phone is structured in a way that's causing you to get hooked on it because of the dopamine. We'll talk about that some more. So the four laws of behavior change. First of all, make it obvious, make it apparent, make it easy, uh, make it attractive, make it satisfying. So all the things that we talked about in the uh, four-step loop, how can we... Um, how, how can we design this so that we get to the habits that we want in the most powerful, effective way? So the first one that you can do is a thing called habit stacking. I'm lousy with um, flossing my teeth. Anyone else like that? Because it was kind of an uh, uncommon thing that I used to do until uh, I got a water pick, one of the portable water picks that's in the shower. And guess what? I do everything else in the shower, brush my teeth, Comb, uh, wash my hair, um, shave. And so fitting in the water pick when you're stacking a bunch of habits all at the same time and fitting it in the middle of that is one of the most powerful ways that you can create a new habit. Stack habits inside of habits that you're currently doing. Habit stacking. Um, how do we get from one habit to the next habit? So when you start a new habit, it feels pretty awkward, doesn't it? It takes a lot of energy and effort. And you're constantly thinking about it and focused on it until you get to this place where you're not even thinking about it at all. Hey, do you know what the four steps of learning are? Unconscious incompetent, conscious incompetent, conscious competent, con uh, unconscious competent. Well, that's what this is talking about, isn't it? And then, you know, you get to a place where now you know how to drive a car and you can you get the clutch and the gear and the steering and a turn signal and all of that's working great. And now you can drive to work without even, like you get to work and you, didn't, you haven't had a single thought about the actual act of driving. It just happens automatically. But let's change the context now and take you out of the car you use every day and let's put you in a race car at NASCAR and see how that changes the way that, you, so suddenly you're back to unconscious incompetent. Why do small habits matter? <clears throat> James Clear talked about his book, uh, Atomic Habits, atomic being the smartest particle. So if you uh, make a 1% improvement over the course of a year, 1% per day over the course of a year, that compounds to 38%. So in the minute, making a choice to make a healthy choice doesn't feel like it's gonna affect you. But your weight is a lagging indicator of your eating habits. Your financial health is a lagging indicator of your savings habits. Does that make sense when I say that? So <clears throat> uh, what we're seeing when that compounding accelerates over time is that a relatively simple, easy choice to make one day compounds to a 38% improvement over the course. So some of you talked about um, habits that you started that you failed to keep up over a period of time. So one of the most powerful ways that you can um, become better at tracking habits is to have a thing called a habit tracker. And this is an example of one. So in one case, uh, we're talking about two people that are uh, wishing to lose weight. And one of them says, you know what, I'm just going to make better choices or I'm just going to try better, try harder. I won't eat so much bad food. The other one gets an app or a tracking app or a spreadsheet or a piece of paper and keeps track of everything they eat, their weight every day. Which of those two is gonna have a better outcome? The one who's got structure. Because you know how much willpower you have? Or I have? Do you know how much discipline you have? Not enough. That's true of all of us. Because willpower is a very easily exhausted resource. And you can't rely on your willpower to make the change because it won't happen. You'll break down because we don't have enough willpower. So how do we, what's the substitute for willpower? The substitute is structure. As soon as you create a system or have structure 
as soon as you have a habit tracker, that structure will um, take you and pull you forward because the point of a habit tracker is never break the chain. Never break the chain. So X, 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 X. And now you've done that for a week. And now you've done that for a month. And you're not going to break the chain, are you? So I have it for those people that started something and two months went by and then you fell off the horse, get it, start the practice of a habit tracker. Um, so I talked about the, uh, the first two books. Let me recommend this one called The One Thing. Did you read it? It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, let me recommend it to you. So how do you endure? How long does it take to get a new habit? Say it again. You know, there's a myth about that, that it takes about 21 days. It's, cooking, right? it's about the cooking? Like cooking, they said it's the 21 day it takes to get out of the cooking habit. That's the number 21. Um, that's a bit of an urban myth. Uh, I'll tell you the story of why it uh, got developed that way. Um, in uh, the 60s, NASA was getting prepared to put a man on the moon. And as you're thinking about how to prepare a man for the moon, think about what it would be like to do that for the first time. What's that gonna be like to go into space? And so NASA, the scientists there, had the astronauts go through all kinds of experiments or training to help them get ready. And one of the things they did is they got them to wear goggles 24 seven that inverted the world. So they were seeing everything upside down and they had to wear the goggles 24 seven. What do you think, what happened after about 17, 18, 19 days is the brain rewired and they saw it right side up. And it was from that that they thought that's how long it takes to rewire the brain. So the second part of the exercise, let's do it again. So at, <clears throat> um, so the same group, convex, doing everything. Um, but the change in this case is on day 14, half the group got to take the lenses off. Day goes by, they put the lenses on. What do you think happened? 17, 18, 19 days. So just even one day of getting off the horse caused them to have to reset the chain. So coming back to the idea, the, the, uh, the notion is that on average, it's about 66 days, but it can actually range to as much as 150 days, depending on the exact habit that you're looking to change. So 21 is a good kind of starting point, if that's what um, uh, kind of a rule of thumb. 66 is a better way to, or um, more, um, uh, 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 a more honest, I guess, a more impactful way to be thinking about it. So how do you, how do, you do it? So first of all, if you're gonna change a habit, you can only do that because you choose to. No shoulds, no coulds, no woulds. It's gotta be your idea. Um, you, you wanna do it because you are gonna believe that you're gonna become competent at it, that you're gonna be good enough at it. And uh, you want to do it in a way where you're associating or connecting with people that have the same habits as you wish to have. Do you know that you're the average of the five people that you hang out with the most? You're the average of the five people that you want to hang out with the most. So where's Nathan and who does he want to start hanging out with? The people that he wants to do business with. Um, uh, to make that point in a different way, where's the worst place to send a criminal? Where, worst place to send a criminal is to jail because they hang out with other criminals and they're going to become better as, can you see the problem with the system? So this is what um, this point about relatedness is. So it, <clears throat> figure out why you want to change extrin extrinsic versus intrinsic motivators. What makes, what motivates you? Is it the adoration of outside people or is it something internal to yourself? We're going to talk about developing an action plan. And uh, again, this idea of what we, what we measure gets done. So some productivity myths. Uh, so, if you have 150 priorities, how many priorities do you have? If you have 150 priorities, you have? None. So here's the point of the one thing, you can't have 150 priorities. So the hard thing about um, having priorities is the point of priorities is focus. And focus means you're saying no a lot. 
you're saying no much, much more often than uh, yes. And if you're only gonna say yes to three things, you have to get comfortable with the idea that there's 147 things that suck. Could be better, should be better. But in fact, uh, these are the three things that if I move the needle on these three things, that's what's gonna make the business better. Or that's what's gonna make my life better, or the circumstances better. Uh, number two is uh, anyone here a good multitasker? It's a trap question. So multitasking is worse than a lie. How many brain pr processors do you have in your brain? One. And so what we think of as multitasking is actually switch tasking. And switch tasking has overhead, meaning that it's hard for your brain to go from one topic to the next topic to the next topic. And you're actually slowing down your productivity when you switch, when you multitask. Um, um, we talked about discipline, um, structure is the replacement for willpower. Um, people are, have this myth about a balanced life. I, I want to have a balanced life. And the comment here is magic happens at the extremes. The truth is you don't want a balanced life because balance means in the way that we normally think about it as being equal. And a better way to think about balance and the way that it actually works more effectively is to decide where you want to apply your energy. As long as you're applying your energy in a way that is aligned with your values, it can be that all of your energy or the vast chunk of it is against your work. As long as, long as that's not harming yourself or a relationship, that's what balance could look like for a while. 90% of all your creative energy goes into work or into a, a, a relationship. So balance isn't the idea that everything's equal. Balance is the idea that you're living your life in a way that's aligned with your goals, aligned with your values. Oh, Pareto's principle. So 20% of your efforts creates 80% of your results. 80% of the land in Italy when Pareto made this first this discovery was owned by 20% of the people. And then he went on to discover that this law in, uh, is uh, true in all of nature, the 80-20 rule. So an exercise or a habit, if you want to adopt a great habit, let me suggest that this is the habit that you pick up and start your day with. What is the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier and unnecessary? What is the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be unnecessary or easier? And there's three components to this. So first of all, it starts with focus. What is the one thing? <coughs> Something has to happen. Not I want to, I, it'd be nice. No woulda, shoulda, coulda. It will happen. And then the third part is that the rest of life will be easier. So personal story, I started, I was a coach, started as a coach 15 years ago, 2004. Um, uh, the early days are kind of tough. Anybody who's ever started a business knows how hard it is to get a business off the ground. I'd be tossing and turning at night thinking, how am I gonna pay the bills? How am I gonna make this work? And then I had an epiphany. I had a middle of the night kind of wake up moment where I recognized, why am I thinking about the crap I don't wanna have to happen in my life? Not paying the bills and how am I gonna pay Visa? What would happen if I turned 180 degrees and looked in the opposite direction and said to myself, what can I do tomorrow to get my next three clients? So when you're looking at the things you're worried about, it creates a vicious circle. It compounds and accelerates because that's what you're thinking about. What is the opposite of a vicious circle? The opposite of a vicious circle is a virtuous circle. <laughs> A virtuous circle has the same properties. It compounds and accelerates. And so um, if you wanna um, um, focus on getting the right, the, the one thing, the one thing in the case for me was what can I do to get my next client? What's the one thing you can, what's the one thing, what's the most important result you need to get tomorrow? What's the one thing you can do to get that result? Oh, so moving on from the one thing, let's talk about the seven habits. Anybody, everybody knows this book, read this book several times, three times, five times. 
what are this? So the first part of this is that <clears throat> development takes place in in three different stages. We have an expert here on uh, child children. So dependence children, dependent on others, independent as we um, start to create our own identity, and then interdependence. So the seven habits, just as a reminder for those that read this book, uh, be proactive, begin with the end in mind, first things first. That's the conquering of the self. Think when, when, seek first to understand, then to be understood and synergize. That's the conquering of the relationship with others. And then overarching all of that is the idea of sharpening the saw. So what is be proactive? Uh, be proactive is the ability to make a choice. It's the ability not to react, but to choose to respond, to have the capability of stopping the trigger and responding. And the way that they think about it is this idea of the circle of control versus the circle um, uh, of concern. So things outside your circle of control is everything everyone else thinks about you, their attitude, what they think, their opinion. I still have trouble with this one, getting cut off in traffic. I get, give them the finger. I get triggered. Why is what their behavior starting to affect me, right? The circle of uh, control is everything that's internal to you. And this is where your internal power comes from. And the greater your circle of uh, control becomes, the greater personal power you have in, every, in any situation. So begin with the end in mind. Someone I was talking to started to talk about that. Develop an outcome-oriented mindset. So everything we create, everything created by humankind gets created three times. Gets created three times. So first time it's in your uh, imagination, and then it's a uh, representation, and then it's a manifestation. So first we have to imagine it in our head. Then we create a blueprint or a model or some kind of representation of the idea, and then we go ahead and build it. Right. So everything gets created three times. Uh, Covey talked about. Uh, starting with the end in mind by saying to yourself, what do I want the end of my life to look like? Why don't you write your eulogy today? Think about what that might like be like. To write your eulogy today would mean that you'd be expecting someone to be saying nice things about you at your service. And that kind of begs a question, doesn't it? What would I have to do today to get earn that eulogy? What do I have to do to land up with being in that place and with that end in mind? So the habits of very successful people is they start with the end in mind. Um, the habits of highly effective people is they put first things first. So the key to time management is not what you prioritize, but to schedule your priorities. So I heard some several people say they ran out of time. You didn't. You chose to make, you made a choice about how you spend your time. And I'm going to say this to you again later. You are a perfect reflection of your calendar. And calendars never lie. You are a perfect, the results you get in your life are a perfect reflection of how you spend your time. And how you spend your time is really truly what uh, your priorities are, regardless of what you say they are. Show me your calendar, I'll show you your priorities. And so Covey talks about these four quadrants, urgent versus not urgent, important versus not important. And the quadrant in the upper right, important, not urgent. This is a right-hand drive car, so that's where all the power is in this car. Can you see that? And where do we get uh, caught up? So the urgent and important, our goal there is to manage that. The uh, important, not urgent, is the space that we often don't give enough space. It's important, but I can put it off today. And then I can put it off tomorrow. The uh, urgent, not important is avoid. And uh, not urgent, not important, just cut it off, limit it. So think win-win. You can only achieve win-win solutions when you have win-win processes. What do you think these two mules are doing? Let's try harder. I got to get to my pile of hay, 
Now I'll even take a running start at it. And the two of them are looking at each other. This is not working. This is no fun. And when they reframe how they think about it, let's just make it so we both win. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Listen to understand, not to respond. And Anais Nin put it in what I think is a very interesting way. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So when we're listening to another person, what filter, what lens are we using when we listen? Our biases. And so that it's those biases with which we're filtering what someone else is talking to us. And so that's why so often we don't get it right. So um, seek first to understand and then to be understood really means that before I get the comment, I have to dem demonstrate to you that I understand your point to your satisfaction. Let me see if I understand you correctly. Is this about what you're saying? Is this exactly what you're saying to me? Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Uh, synergize, so develop inter innovative problem solving techniques. So synergize really is about a philosophy about how you think about uh, scarcity versus abundance. So the world divides into two in lots of different ways. One of the ways it divides is either you have a scarcity or a fixed mindset. Carol Dweck talked about fixed mindset. Or you have a growth or abundance mindset. So what does this mean? So pe people with a scarcity mindset say, I want more pie, that means I gotta get some pie from you. Because the pie is limited. There's a scarce amount of it. There's a fixed amount of it. Another mindset says, you know what, if we worked on making this pie bigger, and then I just got my portion of that, we both end up with more pie, isn't it? So networking or strategic alliances or joint ventures only work because people have an abundance mentality. And if you're working with someone who is uh, wanting to create a, uh, a JV or a strategic alliance and they um, demonstrate time and time again to you that they have a scarcity mentality, you're not gonna have a successful partnership. So the first thing you gotta get right is tell me a little bit about what you're looking to get out of this relationship. How are we gonna work together? What are we gonna do if we disagree with each other? Have those conversations so you can uncover, discover before you invest a lot of effort into it, whether there's scarcity or abundance. And then finally, sharpen the saw against these four things. Um, sharpen the saw so everybody knows the Abe Lincoln story. Abe Lincoln was given an hour to cut a tree and he spent the first uh, 30 minutes sharpening the saw so that he had a nice sharp saw when he cut the tree and he was able to cut it in 15 minutes instead of using the whole hour and struggling the entire time. Start with a sharper saw. So let me recommend the seven habits of highly effective people. So everything you have in your life is a perfect reflection of how you spend your time. So let's focus in on that and that'll be the final part of uh, what we're gonna cover off today. So your calendar knows precisely what you care about. When was the last time you did an audit of how you spent your time? So print out a piece of paper or get a time tracker kind of tool. And for a week in a block of 15 minutes, so very tight, very um, uh, high level of granularity, record what you're doing with your time. And at the end of the week, what you're gonna discover uh, with the dozens and dozens, hundreds of people I've done this with, the first thing you're gonna discover is you're gonna be embarrassed. Everybody knows that, right? Do you hear that chuckle? Because you're gonna find that about 25% of the time, uh, you're wasting it, you're not using it very effectively. And so the first benefit of doing this is that that'll become visible to you and you'll make better choices. Especially if you have an accountability partner you're gonna share it with. So honey, at the end of this week, I'm gonna show you my time audit. Would you give me a few minutes to, so I can run it over with you? You know what that's gonna be like as you go through the rest of that week. Uh, so do a time audit. If you uh, have the same job and you've been doing the same thing for a year, you can do this once a year. But if your job changes with one uh, client, uh, we were doing this every month because the, the nature of what she was doing changed so much. So here's the second part of the exercise and why this matters. You're going to do a thing called a skill fun box. So the skill fun box you see on the uh, vertical axis is skill level from high to low. And on the horizontal axis is 
uh, fun, and by fun in this case, I mean uh, productive, mean rewarding, means uh, getting paid. So when you're in front of a client, what's your time worth? When you're charging, what's your billable rate? Somebody give me a number, any number. 150 an hour, great. So um, uh, what's the kind of work that you do that's low scale, low fun? What's low scale, low fun? Stuff that would be on your audit. What's examples of low scale, low fun in, in your everyday work? Social media posting. YouTube videos. YouTube videos. So how much would you be able to pay an accountant to do the receipts and accounting? Mine's 10. And he is a fully trained accountant, not a bookkeeper, an accountant in Venezuela. So for every hour that you get someone else to do that, those kinds of work, you can then free up six, seven, eight, nine hours of your life to either get your life back or spend six, seven, eight, nine hours, do more prospecting or six, seven, eight hours that you actually get paid. So um, for social media posting, um, my VA is in uh, the Philippines and does this for me uh, at 10 bucks an hour. And just in case you think that that is uh, outrageous, the average income in uh, the Philippines is uh, around four bucks an hour. She's university trained and she's living large on 10 bucks an hour. So the goal of the exercise, first of all, get smarter about how you spend your time. And then secondly, to identify, give yourself a challenge. I'm gonna find six to eight hours of work that I currently do that someone will happily do for me at a fraction of the, of the value of the time I could get if I used it in a different way. So you equal your calendar and calendars never lie. You equal your calendar and calendars never lie. Um, so we've talked about the phone. Um, how much time should a phone be put in the uh, do not disturb? 100% of the time. Every time you take an, uh, it's, um, Tony Robbins says that we're most effective when we chunk our time into two hour blocks. So we do a thing for two hours. Every time we take an interruption, it takes about 20 minutes to get back to the same level of focus as you had before the interruption occurred. So if you respond to your phone three times in a two hour block, how much productivity have you lost? About half of it. And so you have to make a decision about your relationship with your phone. Does it operate you or do you operate it? And if the phone buzzes and you pick it up, it's operating you. In fact, you've become a slave or a servant to your phone. Crazy to think about it that way, right? But I, did I tell you about the dopamine? Oh, somebody loves me. Let me see what that is. So one of the fundamental better habits you can pick is to turn your notifications off period, 100% of the time. Um, you guys in the room are pretty clever about this, but you, you know that you can uh, uh, turn off the ringer on the phone and have certain numbers uh, flow through, emergency bypass. So my wife can get this phone to ring, even with the do not disturb set up. But she knows that if she's phoning me, I will take the call. Even right now, I take the call because I know there's a fire truck at the door. And there better be if you're following me. Does that make sense? So one of the habits that you might consider adopting is to change the way or the habits that you have around your phone. And that by itself will make you more productive. Uh, realtors or people that feel like they need to be available to their clients sometimes stress about this because they feel like, oh man, if, you know, my client's phone and they want to talk their deal or the other realtors phoning and they want to talk the deal. And uh, the, the suggestion I make in that instance is that you have an outgoing message that says, hey, thanks for the call. I return all calls at quarter of the hour. And so what that means is right now it's 812. It might be 30 minutes before that person would get a return call. But here's what it does for you. You now freed up 45 minutes to focus on something, to do the one thing. 
Um, the other thing it does is at a quarter to the hour, you're now going to be able to triage the calls because they're not happening randomly. You're going to luck, oh, there's three calls, two don't really matter. I can, but this one does matter. So instead of being disrupted three times, you're being, um, you're stopping what you're doing, uh, focusing on the calls, taking the one call that mattered and dealing with the other ones later. So let me consider that, or let me suggest that as a, a possibility for you. So last point, success begins with mindset. Uh, people often think about this thing as uh, be, do, have. And so lots of people think about life and they say, well, if, uh, once I have, whatever that might be, then I'll do, and then I'll become. But it actually, it works better if it's the other way around. Who must I be so that I can do in order to have? What beliefs should I have? Who should I become as a human being? What choices would a healthy person make about diet? Once you've identified and created your identity, the rest of it flows easier. Instead of working the, other, the outside in, it's the inside out. Affirmations, everybody got affirmations? I am statements. What's an, how do you define your identity? Your identity is defined by the things you say to yourself about yourself when no one else is looking. I am statements. And most of the statements, most of the self-talk we have is negative or limiting or undermining. And so that creates the vicious circle. How do you get the opposite of that? How do you get something that's a virtuous circle? Program the things that you wish to be saying about yourself. I am motivated uh, and motivating. I go after my goals as if they're a want, not just a must. That's an example of an affirmation. So that, that becomes the, the way that you talk to yourself. So Jim Rohn put it this way, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Don't wish it was better. Wish, uh, don't wish it was easier. Wish that you were better. So better is not something you wish, it's something you become. The B part again, B do you have. For things to change, it starts with you. Anybody have any questions about anything we just touched on? A thought, a comment, pushback? This is too easy. Yeah. Yeah. So Lee is recommending a book called, um, uh, what's Carol's book? Mindset. Mindset. Yeah. It's an awesome book. And I would add it to this list. Fixed versus growth mindset. What, what would you say? How do you get someone else to see um, Well, it starts with uh, having them recognize it for themselves, isn't it? And uh, uh, as a coach, I know that one of the worst ways to attempt to do that is you should. Statements, yeah. So um, the um, Socratic method of doing it or Socrates' way of doing it is to help people figure it out for themselves that, that they discover. On, uh, and the way that we can assist that is to help guide their thinking through the questions we ask. So you, you have the most power in a relationship if you're the one asking the questions because the questions guide the conversation. So um, someone asked about which uh, social media channels you should be on. Yeah, that's right. Let me ask the question a different way. Where are your clients? What social media channels are they on? Mm. Those are the ones you should be on. I'm not even See, that's the change in the question you should yeah. be asking yourself, don't you think? Uh, Aiden. So, at the end of the day, there's, there's many things that I grew up with who were overly compliant. The main part of the process is self reflective. Yeah. That's that you're advertising. There's all this stuff that you have yeah. to do. How do you, I know that in an ideal world, you were outsourcing the, the cheap stuff to you know, whatever, but how do you best define, okay, these are the tasks that you should be doing and actually you still want to be less, but you want to be less. Yeah. Yeah. Show me your default calendar. Do you have one? Do you have a default calendar? Can I describe it to you? So you have to answer the four questions. 
So the first of the four questions is, what's the most important result you need to get today or this week? Write that down. What are the most important results I need to get today or this week? Number two is, what activity, what do I got to do to get that result? Number three is, uh, how much of that activity? And then number four is, where do I make appointments with myself so that I block out my calendar so it matches the amount of time that I've declared I need? So where in your calendar is your prospecting time? Usually. Make an appointment with yourself. That sounds like from 9 to 11 every day I have phone fun. 9 to 11 every day because I know it takes two hours a day of phone fun to get enough prospects in a week. Um, and then ultimately you got to pay one of two prices, the pain of disappointment or the pain of disappointment. So uh, tomorrow when you ask yourself that question, go look up the phrase uh, default calendar or time blocking. It's the answer to your question. So you don't, um, you schedule your priorities. So what are your priorities? And then how do you map your time so that it matches truly those priorities? So that's number one. Number two is, um, let's say that you have a list of 100 things you need to do. And you narrow that down to the 10 most important. And then you say, well, you know what? I've got uh, 96 15-minute blocks a day. Yeah, 96. 15, 24 times 4. And I'm going to allocate uh, 10 of those to the number one thing, uh, five of them to number two and three of those 15-minute blocks, and the 10th one gets one. And you won't get much done. You're way better off to take the um, three most important, allocate your, all of your time to that. You can't have 100 priorities. Or the way that um, Warren Buffett had a personal pilot, his name is Mike Fink. I've got time for this, Mike Fink. Um, so one day Warren went to Mike and said, and Mike, by the way, uh, was his personal pilot for 10 years, and before that he flew for four US presidents. So the guy's a stud. So one day Warren comes up to him, hey Warren, um, don't you have any, or sorry, uh, Mike, don't you have any uh, career goals? Like, all you want to do is fly for me? And um, yeah, I've got career goals. Well, go off and make a list of goals. So a couple of weeks go by, Mike comes back, he's got 25 goals. Warren says, that's great, 25 goals. What I want you to do is separate it top five, next 20. A couple of weeks, comes back, Warren looks at it, you got your top five, that's great. So uh, Mike, what are you gonna do with the next 20? And Mike says, well, you know, the top five matter, but I'm gonna get to the 20 as I can. And Warren's response was no, it's a never to be looked at list until something drops off the top five. So um, Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates met as a result of Mrs. Gates, who was a friend of the woman that um, uh, Warren Buffett was dating. So he invite, she invited both Warren and Bill to a dinner, and Warren's like, why am I going to meet this computer geek guy? And Bill is like, I'm going to meet a stock picker? Like, why am I going to meet this guy? And, uh, of course, they met, and the rest of the story is they became great, great, great friends. But at that dinner, Mrs. Gates said, what's the secret to the success? And both of them had the same one-word answer. Focus. Or Steve Jobs put it this way. When he... Uh, Started Apple, left, went to Pixar, came back. Apple was like months away from failing, bankruptcy. And Apple was trying to do a bunch of, bunch of things. And uh, after, uh, he was really famous for taking over the whiteboard. And uh, what he did is he drew a kind of a cross and he said at the top, pro and uh, consumer and laptop and desktop, we're going to do one of each, that's it. That's all we're going to do as a company. Now this was in 1999, and he went on. But uh, what, what he was very, very good at is focus. Singular, persistent, get it done, focus. So the most important thing I'd say to you, Aiden, is you don't have 100 priorities. Sure. And at the same time, I need maybe to apply right. uh, for a PhD there. Yeah. And also, I have an interview. I have some interview to do. 
Sure. So all of that will follow me and I will take it in there to become the best version of myself. Sure. Do you think with tracking is still alive? Yes, it is. Yes. And how do you prioritize? Uh, sure. Design? So how do you prioritize when you've got so many competing demands on your time? So it, it comes down in the same field. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, you got comfortable that you're going to say no more often than yes. That's really hard to do. We want to say yes. We're wired that way. But you can't have 150 priorities. So the first thing is you got to really focus. What is the one thing? What's the one thing I could do today such by doing it is I'm going to get the result I'm looking for. Keep focusing, keep focusing, keep focusing. Um, so then number two is that show me your default calendar. Show me your priorities. What's the most important results I need to get today? What activity, what I got to do to get that result? How much of that activity, how much time is it going to take? And then I'm going to, I've got to, hey, let me put it this way. Would you get on an airplane if you knew the pilot didn't have a navigation plan? Would you get on that airplane? You kind of, what are you thinking? So show me your default calendar. Show me the map of how you're going to spend your time this week. Because if you don't have one of those things, it's the equivalent of getting on the airplane. You're just going to randomly react to whatever is happening to you next. Um, I forget who said this. Once you've spent your money, you can always make some more. Once you've spent your time, it's gone forever. Your time is your most precious resort, resource. Everything you have is a Everything you have in life is a perfect outcome of how you currently spend your time. So if there's any single habit that you take out of this discussion tonight is rethink or have a careful think about how you spend your time, how you allocate your energy, what your true priorities are, um, and uh, find a better way to cut out the noise. Focus on signal. Does that help? Does it? I'm, um, I'm going to... If you uh, remember this website, timewithjohn.com, it's a link to my calendar, and I'll, I'll, uh, we'll book for a 15-minute meeting, and I'll show you what a default diary looks like, okay? So you'll actually see it and be able to visualize. And so that's true for anyone, timewithjohn.com. Um, was there another question somewhere? Another comment? No, okay. That's that. So if the owner wants a better business, first the business needs a better one of those. If the owner wants a better business, first the business needs a better owner. Many business problems are personal problems in disguise. Let me rephrase that. All business problems are personal problems in disguise. I've been a coach for 15 years. I've come to learn the wisdom of that. And so when people think about coaching, oh man, I've gotten this backwards. Sorry about that. Um, so for me, uh, and when people think about business coaching, they're thinking about business growth, consistent tools and strategies around business. But business growth is also about personal growth, business coaching. Uh, and that's usually around leadership, communication, and delegation. And then finally, the other part of coaching is holding you accountable for the stuff you say you're going to do. And when you do all that, it all comes together into uh, and getting a result. So when people start working with me, it's because they want their business to be coached. But what we learn over time as we work together is that really the person needs to be coached. So lots of business owners think about personal coaching as like we're going to be sitting around and you know burning incense and that kind of stuff, and that's not what it is at all. Um, so I uh, invite you to uh, click into my calendar, timewithjohn.com. It'll uh, hook us up into a Zoom link if you've got a question or two about how uh, time blocking works or how anything we talked about tonight. I'm happy to talk to you about that. And if you want to talk about coaching, I'm happy to talk about that as well. So people don't decide their futures. They decide their habits, how they're going to spend their time. And then the habits decide their futures. So thanks for your time together tonight. Uh, yes, we know we get to share. See, we're in the frame, same frame together. You are so tall. John, thank you very, very much on behalf of Vancouver Business Network. Click once. And Ion Connect, thank you so much for making this reproduction possible. Good night. Stunned silence. <laughs>